Michelle Weed Brown describes herself as someone who was in the wilderness for 40 years, and then God rescued her in a big way. We are so delighted to have her as our featured guest on this week's edition of My Faith with Homer and Pip. For Brent Young, our marvelous producer, and the Homer who had the vision with the Holy Spirit for this endeavor, which we pray will help you, inspire you in some way on your journey toward the cross and through it. I'm Tommy Pippins. Homer always kicks it off, this time with Michelle Weed Brown. Homer? Michelle, it's never original. It's the same for every show. Uh, my fascination for and our fascination for your faith, but also my curiosity is always, where do you choose to start? Oh, amen. So take it away. Well, that is a really um, tough question because the Lord has done so much for me in my life. And it's truly a, a love story and a redemption story all in, and a, a transforming story that continues on in the journey. So, but I guess I, I can start with what Tom was saying. Um, if 40 years in the wilderness, I refer to that as um, my time before I was born again, before the Lord really got a hold of me and I was lost and broken. Uh, I was a broken, um, you know, wounded, I guess, soldier in the battlefield. And I started off my faith journey as a, a little girl who had a really close best friendship with Jesus. He was my best friend. And um, I was raised up in the faith, um, in the church, and um, had a very strong Christian rooted family. Uh, however, the enemy tried to get a hold of me and use circumstances in my life where um, I had roots of abandonment and rejection in my childhood, uh, broken family, um, different times where um, I thought the Lord had even abandoned me. So my, my faith, I guess, in my teens and my young adulthood started to waver because I was running away from the Lord. I was rebelling and I was, you know, choosing to follow my own, you know, I guess, passions and desires that I thought were going to fulfill me. And I was covering up a lot of hurt and shame. And so the Lord, you know, really broke my shame. Um, he, he rescued me, he delivered me. You know, they say that, you know, when you cry out to the Lord, that is, you know, you, you admit that you're a sinner and that you're broken and that, you know, in the AODA world, in the, you know, recovery world of addiction, they refer to it as rock bottom. Well, I think that, I don't think that I hit rock bottom once. I think that there was a time in my, you know, twenties um, after a period that was very dark in my life that I, you know, had succumbed to addiction, um, had very dark, um, abusive relationship, and I was on the verge of suicide and heavily addicted. Um, I cried out to the Lord, but it wasn't until he delivered me and he put his Holy Spirit reassurance and reminder in me that he could break my shame and that it didn't matter how, you know, who or how rejected or abandoned um, I felt or I was so angry at the Lord and all of the woundedness that I had inside of me from childhood sexual trauma and abuse and just trying to cover up and numb all of that pain was a very self-destructive path that I went on. And the whole time Jesus never left me, he never abandoned me. Um, but when I cried out to him, he required something of me. And I think that is what people kind of miss the mark sometimes where they're crying out and they're saying, Lord, you know, deliver me from this, take me out of this, you know, darkness. And I was in, in at that time, the wilderness, I refer to it as you know, we have our time in captivity, where I was in captivity, I was a, a slave to my addictions, I was a slave to my bitterness and my anger of my woundedness. And then God is offering us a time of out of that bondage and captivity into the wilderness to have that moment 
kind of like when Jesus did when he was in the wilderness and Satan tempted him and he used the word of God and the word of truth and those roots that I had in the Christian faith growing up and those reminders that I had as a little girl in that childlike faith that Jesus was my best friend, those all came back flooding into me with reassurance and unconditional love. And God was showing me that there was a promised land, that there was a land, and I'm gonna probably get emotional because the story of redemption and deliverance, it brings tears of joy. And he was showing me the calling on my life. He was reminding me that I wasn't rejected. I wasn't abandoned. I wasn't used goods. I wasn't worthless. I wasn't hopeless. And that he loved me unconditionally. And she was, he was showing me a way out of that captivity into the wilderness and the testing and then into the promised land. And so it was really... I had to come to the end of myself. It's not just surrendering to Jesus by, you know, admitting that you're broken and hitting your rock bottom. It's really dying to yourself and admitting that you need a savior. You need something bigger than yourself. You can't just do it on your own strength. So after my, you know, time in the wilderness, I like to say, God really revealed my, my issues with pride and, you know, the selfishness that I had, I guess, continued to pursue um, with my own desires and, you know, living with thinking that, you know, drugs and alcohol and relationships and looking for love in all the wrong places were going to fulfill me. And he's the only one that could make me whole. He's the only let, one. Let me just ask you, let me just ask you one question. Sure. What was different the time you changed? because I'm sure you had gotten to this place before and this time when yeah. it happened, what was different? What did you feel that was different or what made you change when you clearly had had many opportunities to change prior to that? Something had to be different to change your behavior, your sure. actions. Sure, well, I was, I was turning 40 and that's why I say 40 years in the wilderness because I was turning 40 and I was, you know, married at the time. Um, I got married in uh, 2000 and I had now become a wife and a mother. And I realized that the anger and the bitterness um, was keeping me held prisoner. I was, I, I had found myself in a, in a jail cell in my twenties um, due to my own, you know, consequences and the lifestyle that I was living um, with addiction and trying to survive and not doing a very good job of it. And I realized that my marriage was going to fall apart, that I was full of anxiety and fear. And, you know, just, I, I wanted to be a good mother and I wanted to be a good wife, but I couldn't have a healthy relationship and thrive in my life and have the peace and the joy that God had intended for me until I completely surrendered my life. So my my life was falling apart um, because I was trying to operate in my own strength and I wasn't giving the Lord the throne of my heart. I wasn't surrendering fully to him. And my father was murdered in 1998. So two years before I got married, um, my father was shot and killed six times. And it was my stepmother of 10 years um, who shot my father. And along with this, you know, re being reminded that I'm a Christian, I'm called to forgive. I was raised up in the Lutheran faith for 40 years. I'm, you know, this is what I'm called to do. This is what I'm supposed to do. Underneath, underlying all of that pain and that woundedness from, you know, the sexual assault and the sexual abuse and the abandonment and the rejection was all this anger and all of this bitterness and the stronghold of unforgiveness. And so my husband and I sought counseling um, after my dad was murdered. Basically, I spent 12 years in this you know, whirlwind of wilderness of just trying to overcome this pain and just kind of blocking it out and just being really prideful and independent and carrying that religion in me and that, that you know, pride of self-righteousness or 
just knowing that, you know, I, I guess I felt that I was already saved. I felt that I was already, you know, good enough. And that I, and then the Lord showed me that, you know, it was a, a real brokenness of coming to the end of myself. And so I cried out to him and I asked him, you know, to really change my heart and help, help me because, you know, I just felt that I wasn't going to, I was going to be this victim forever and keep making excuses and be full of pride. And so the Lord brought me to um, Salvation Army shelter. I'd always wanted to serve at, at a shelter in my family. And we were going there to serve and the Holy Spirit just rocked my world. He really, he just I had a, a powerful encounter with the Holy Spirit that just revealed to me my bondage, my captivity was that spirit of unforgiveness and all of that brokenness and woundedness and that victim mentality that I had, the Lord wanted to, to give me a new life and I was born again and just, I was given a, a new creation opportunity. The first scripture he gave me was 2 Corinthians 5, 17 that therefore anyone who's in Christ is a new creation, that the, you know, the old things have gone, behold, the new has come. And so I had to leave my past behind and just walk into the new that he had for me, the calling that he had on my life. But in order to do that, I had to forgive. And so I, I wa started walking through and going to attending Bible studies. And as I started to go and attend Bible studies and really share my brokenness and you know allow the lord to do the work in my heart i fell in love with the lord and he started to tr transform my mind renew my mind and heal my heart and show me that i really had some deep wounds and a, a deeper root of bitterness that was attached to all these other strongholds of the rejection and abandonment and so i wrote a a letter through the Victim Witness Protection Agency. I really highly recommend the Restorative Justice Program through Marquette um, University. And it was a victim offender dialogue process that I had to walk through, but I it was a year long process. And when I what God was showing me was that I needed to forgive my stepmother for murdering my father and that the Lord was gonna take what the enemy meant for evil and use it for good. And I was, you know, just really struggling. I was like, but Lord, I need to hear her apologize to me. I need to hear her say that she's sorry. And through the whole murder trial, that didn't happen. Through, you know, the years of pain and grieving, that didn't happen. And the Lord was showing me that because I had been forgiven much, now I needed to love much. And even if I never get an apology or never get an explanation, then I needed to forgive. And in doing that and, and, and writing that first letter and going through all the scriptures on forgiveness, because of what the Lord had done for me, and he had forgiven me, he softened my heart and I was able to be delivered from that spirit that was hovering over my life, tormenting me. And he started delivering me from addiction, started to change my heart, started to bring love and covering of just his grace and mercy and pouring that into me and the desires for all the addictions and, and the whole chains were broken. Uh, the, the bondage, the, the captivity, I felt this burden lifted from me. And I wrote this letter for four hours and just poured out all my tears and the anger and the frustration and all the things that I felt and sh then shared with my stepmother that God has forgiven me and now I can forgive you through the love of Christ. So during that year long, process of you know advocacy and preparation we prepared for a victim offender dialogue and we had a confrontational four-hour meeting my husband and I and my stepmom and Janine Getsky I want to shout out to her because it was a very powerful facilitation that that she orchestrated through the restorative justice program and we sat down at the Tachita Correctional Institution and I had my first you know, reconciliation meeting with my stepmother. And that from that point on, I was able to visit her, write letters to her, go to her parole hearings and speak on her behalf on how the Lord had restored and reconciled our life. And now we were going to use what the enemy meant for evil, for good. And so that was really, I think the pivotal changing point that the Lord showed me 
called me to jail and prison ministry um, after that point and put the calling on my life to surrender him. And now my life is not my own anymore. Now I owe everything that I have to the Lord for what he's done for me. And I just, he's given me an Isaiah 61 ministry to preach the good news, to set the other captives free that are in brokenness and in bondage and captivity. And I've been set free, I've been rescued, I've been delivered. And so now he has a calling on my life to continue to help others know the true love and forgiveness of Christ. So was there a day or a point when you realized I'm different, I'm not the same, or were there people at some point that said the same to you, either or both? Yeah, a lot of that. There was a, a transforming, like, you know, just process of it, the Lord began a, a sanctification process in me, I guess, when I start, I didn't go to like, I didn't go to a rehab program, you know, um, I'm 25 years clean from the addiction of crack cocaine, but it was a, like a, 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 a total mind renewal and transformation that it didn't stop there. My addictions didn't stop there when I was delivered from that. I've been clean and sober now for 11 years, but I had a, a, a stronghold of these addictions of running to numb this pain. And when the Lord started to deliver me, I started to, to know that my desires for the things of this world and for chasing after those things to fulfill me and you know make me whole, and those things that I was running to, those desires started to change. And so as those desires started to change, God started filling me up with his Holy Spirit. And as I started dying to myself and surrendering to the Holy Spirit, the Lord just began to fill me up. And then I had powerful mentors in my life um, through our church Shalom Ministries um, that I was serving with for you know, over a decade. And they started speaking into my life and just reminding me, reassuring me, and, you know, just edifying and encouraging me that God had a calling on my life. So that was spoken into my life. Um, my pastor, my lead pastor, Tony Vento, he was a, a major, you know, encourager and discipler and supporter for me. And he really spoke into my life that there was a calling on my life to, to be a pastor and that I had a servant's heart, a servant's pastoral heart. And I really didn't, you know, believe that that I was, you know, that I, I was worthy of that. And so through the help of my other mentors and pastors and just being discipled and, you know, those things being reminded, confirmed, reassured, and, you know, just all of that support system that I had, um, there was just a lot of people that God tried to bring into my life that were, you know, probably his angels that were trying to intervene in my life for 40 years. But it wasn't until I was really ready to be broken and surrendered that God just orchestrated the right leadership and the right mentors and the right you know, orchestration to, to really allow that to happen. And so I didn't go through a 12 step program. I took one step toward Jesus Christ. And that is when he started to really renew my heart and my mind. And it was just, it was just a continued you know, it's a daily surrender. It's a daily giving up of your life and turning it over to allow the Lord to do the work in your heart and mind and that obedience that has to continue on. And it's just a, you know, reassurance. And then recently, you know, coming to um, God Touch Milwaukee and just being, I guess, the divine connection being introduced to what God is powerfully doing in the lives of the men at the transitional home of God Touch Milwaukee. Um, Pastor Marty has really been an encouragement and a, a supporter to me to help confirm um, that calling in my life. And I finished Bible college and seminary last December. So it was a tough road of, you know, continued perseverance and endurance through um, some struggles and challenges that the Lord always uses to you know, make us stronger and uh, remind us who we are, that new creation, and that he has a purpose and a plan for our lives. And no matter what the enemy tries to do to rob our destiny um, and steal our identity, God is always there to 
you know, with his powerful, perfect timing to show us that he's able to do beyond what we can ask, think, or imagine. And so I was introduced and inspired to God Touch Milwaukee uh, back in November of 2020 when they had a fundraiser. And God had put the passion on my heart as a jail and prison chapel rep um, for the last you know decade or so um, to really need to find placement for women that were coming out of incarceration, that were finding it hard to just go through the transition that they need to go through to get the support that they need, the mentoring that they need, the discipleship and counseling that they need, the healing from trauma. And because I had experienced and healed and been delivered, and God is doing this process of you know, peeling us like an onion. He's showing me that the trauma can be healed with the right unconditional love. The pain and addiction and, you know, all the sorrow and the grief can be healed with the power of his redeeming love. And so this burden on my heart that I had for over seven years to really want to get involved in transitional, you know, ministry for women to redeem and restore and help you know, set those captives free and give them a, a crown of beauty for ashes and, you know, give them that robe of righteousness that the Lord had given me and a garment of praise instead of that, you know, shame. When the Lord broke my shame, he put on my heart. Now start going after other people. When he healed me and delivered me from my addictions, he was speaking into my life, go after the other people, set the other captives free. I had created a prison for my, I was in a prison of my own, a prison of my, for, I created that prison for myself by the choices that I made, but now by the freedom and healing and deliverance and unconditional love of Christ, I've been set free. And now my responsibility, my obedience, my sacrifice that I need to turn my life over to the Lord is to go after those other broken vessels and to help make a difference in their lives. What's the first thing of all the people you've addressed? What's the first thing you want to tell them based on your own experience? Yeah, and you know, if you had only 30 seconds or you knew they were leaving, you'd say, I, I just have to tell you this because of what I feel and I know from my own life and where you are. Yeah, I would have to tell them that you can't not do it on your own strength, that Jesus is the only way that he's the ultimate healer, that unless you surrender your life to Jesus Christ and allow him to come into your heart and come into your life and have that right relationship with him, this is going to be a struggle, a continued struggle that you'll try to survive, but you won't thrive, but you can be set free. He can heal you, but you have to be willing to allow him to be the Lord of your life. He's the only way, the truth and the life, the only way to that freedom the only way to be set free from that bondage and captivity is through the unconditional redeeming supernatural power of Jesus Christ. I, I will defer to Tommy, but I have one more. When it was the lowest of the low, what was the first thing you thought when you woke up in the morning? Mm -hmm. And now mm -hmm. that your life has changed to where you are now, what's the first thing that you think when you wake up in the morning? Ugh. The first thing that I think when I wake up in the morning is I need to get back on my knees and thank God each and every day because every day it's a turning over my heart and continuing to give that that heart to the Lord and knowing that I have to die to myself. He's the first thing on my mind and my heart with thankfulness and gratefulness when I wake up in the morning. I just thank you, Jesus, that you can be glorified through my life. And that's what I want to do. I want to glorify him. I want him to get the praise and the honor and the glory because he set me free. And I just, I'm thankful, I'm grateful, and I'm blessed. And I need to and remember and be reminded and be humbled every day by that. And what was it when you were at rock bottom? At rock bottom, it was flooded with fear and torment and just survival. It was, it was very dark. It was you know, just always having to feel that I needed to prove myself, to earn love, to, you know, to, to perform, you know, to learn, to learn how to embrace that unconditional love now, the love of the father, 
you know, having had the rejection and abandonment, you know, from my own father, earthly father, knowing that my heavenly father was always there with, and he's always there to welcome us back with open arms. I'm like the prodigal daughter, you know, story. I ran away from Jesus, but he was always there with open arms to welcome me back in, into the, you know, home of the kingdom of God. And so that, that darkness, that was, it was a living hell. It was a prison, you know, a, a prison that surrounded me, that tormented me. And that I guess I just didn't know how to break free of, you know, I didn't, I didn't know how to, I guess in the back of my mind and my heart, um, I was so angry at the Lord and I was feeling that so much independence and pride could, could, you know, I could do it on my own that I didn't need God's help anymore because he had abandoned me. And I was so full of, you know, that feeling, those feelings of rejection that I, I was afraid to, I guess, ashamed to come back to the Lord. I was hiding, you know, running away because I was ashamed. And yet here he was waiting for me the whole time with that unconditional love to wrap his loving arms around me and say, welcome home, daughter. Uh, I defer to Tommy. Uh, take it away. I'm just sitting here smiling. I mean, what more can you add to such an incredible, powerful testimony? Michelle Weed Brown on My Faith with Homer and Pip, as you look back now and you've referenced it, Jesus was always there through the hurt and the pain. And like many of us, you tried everything in this world to feel good, but it was only the love of our Lord and Savior. Um, there are many who are in a similar situation, have considered suicide. Some have taken their lives. I think of a, a gentleman recently, a young dad, you know, in the church and what have you. Who knows what desperation, what, what hurt and pain he felt, what woundedness. We hear a lot about male woundedness wounds throughout but what do you say to that person who may be at wit's end today and perhaps by god's grace is listening to your voice and seeing you right now yeah i uh, i've been there i've been at the that point of wanting to just end it all and to give up and and i and, you know i was tormented as well and i would say to that person that god loves you so much that you are created for a purpose that he has a plan for your life and that it's not over that don't throw in the towel because God is reaching out with his hand to just grab yours. When I was in that pit of despair and I was in that place of darkness, if I would have just reached up and taken the Lord's hand, he would have pulled me out of that pit. He says that he does that for us, that he pulls us out of that pit of darkness and he's just waiting to take our hand and rescue us. And he's there with unconditional love. So I would say to that person that God loves you, that Jesus has such a powerful plan and purpose for your life. And it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how many mistakes you think you've made or how hopeless you think you are or how worthless you think you are. You're, you are beautiful in his eyes. You are beautiful in his sight. You're his creation and he loves you. So don't ever give up. Don't don't ever give up on yourself because Jesus will never give up on you. Just take his hand and he'll pull you out and he'll redeem you, restore you, and give you the strength that you need to continue on. You know, in Romans, it talks about paraphrasing, as I always do, because I don't have all the, the words. But, you know, these bad things happen, but uh, God works it all according to his good. For those who have been called according to his purpose. How Amen. cool to know that you've been called according to his purpose amen amen as i said he's he's got a plan to prosper us and not to harm us plans to give us hope in the future but it's not until we seek him with our whole heart that we'll find him and when we call upon him that he's going to answer you know jeremiah 29 11 so through 14 i would say he brings us out of that captivity and but we chase after those things that we think are going to fill those voids and make us whole but he's really the only thing that can make us whole. And, you know, he's, he, he's just, he's my deliverer, you know, from death to life, literally. Um, you know, it's just amazing what God can do for you. If you give him the opportunity to, if you, you confess your sins to him, he's faithful and he's just to forgive you and cleanse you 
from all unrighteousness. So you can have a clean slate. You can be, you know, start fresh. You can, he'll wipe the slate clean and he'll make you a new creation. He'll dust you off. He'll pick you back up. And, you know, he'll give you a powerful purpose and show you uh, what you're created for. That's marvelous. What can you add to that? I, I would just ask one more and then I'd like to get it back to Homer. Uh, how has this transformation uh, with falling in love with your Lord and Savior impacted you as a mom of that wonderful 20-year-old daughter you have? Mm. Yeah, it, she was definitely one of my biggest incentives to want to be, you know, a godly kingdom woman and to want to be an example of, you know, God's grace and mercy and unconditional love. She is just the biggest, most precious blessing and gift in my life, you know, besides my salvation, uh, besides the Lord um, giving me a, a, a loving, supportive, amazing uh, spouse and my husband, I wouldn't have, you know, my daughter, if it wasn't for God bringing my, my wonderful husband and supportive spouse into my life of almost 22 years this year. And so our daughter is just the most precious gift. And it's really impacted me to want to help other moms uh, know their kingdom purpose and their kingdom calling and be able to to show our daughters you know what it means to be redeemed and what it means to embrace the unconditional love of our father and our lord and savior jesus christ because without him we're nothing without him we're just out there trying to thrive and you know the world is telling us we need to look one way and be a certain way and to you know meet the approval of man and the only approval we really need to meet is god's approval and so you know just reminding my daughter and trying to encourage her and you know instill those morals and those values in her that to continue to have hope in her faith in jesus christ is just it's been a blessing for me to be um, given the precious gift to be a mother and so it's made i guess one of the most powerful impacts on me um, to want to change my life and to want to go back to my roots and, um, you know, have that childlike faith and pursue a right relationship with Jesus um, because I wanted to her to grow up with strong Christian foundation and in a loving household with a loving family, with a mom and a dad that can show her how to walk with Jesus. And so mm -hmm. I, I want to show other women and help other women I'll thrive in their kingdom role and, and to be godly women as well. Unconditional love that flies in the face of the world, as you know so well, Michelle. Homer? I only have one last, and that is, I'm wondering what you thought when you had given up and you gave everything to Jesus, to God, and imagined what, imagined what could happen, and that you probably never dreamt that it could be this good. I don't know what you thought was about turning it around and if you use the word amazed if it ever surprises you just what incredible things have happened even given what you may have thought that day yeah it's it's really it's it's because i i only want to share my testimony of what god's going to you know continue to do and that he's, we're still a work in progress i only want to share you know, my testimony as a way of, you know, I, I'm not looking back. You know what I mean? I'm not looking back. I'm, I'm going, I'm moving forward into his purpose and living a victorious life. And I think that, you know, it's just, it's so important that people don't fall prey to, you know, falling into the temptation of reverting back, you know, to their past and letting their past dictate their future. And I think it's moving from that victim mentality into knowing that unconditional love of Christ and that victorious um, life that he gives us the opportunity to live as a born again, new creation. I think that it's so hard looking back because once you've tasted the things of God, you know, once you, he's, he's changed your, your complete perspective and your heart and you renewed your mind, you, you're not, you're not that person anymore. And it's, it's hard because I don't look with shame anymore or regret or guilt about the experiences and the the life you know circumstances that happen i look at it as a powerful testimony that god can use to relate to other people 
to help redeem and to change the lives of others and to bring glory to him in the kingdom. So it's hard looking back. Um, but when I look back, I look back as, you know, wow, um, I'm overwhelmed. I'm humbled. I'm grateful. And I just, I thank God for everything that he's done for me. And I want to give all the praise and honor and glory to him and just continue to be obedient to the calling on my life by serving him and serving others. You I hope better not have anything question. else, Tommy. No, no, I don't. No, I don't. Yes, I, did. I'm learning I hope, to. I hope that I answers your question. It you, did. You, yes. Michelle Weed Brown, we know that with every breath, you want to honor and glorify the Lord who loves you so much and whom you love back by his grace. And you've done that today on My Faith with Homer and Pip and on behalf of Brent Young, our producer, and Steve the Homer True with the Holy Spirit put this endeavor together, which we hope and pray will inspire and impact and maybe even save a life. Uh, you have been there for standing in the gap. Thank you so much. And God bless you and your wonderful family and Marty and that incredible ministry you're involved in. Thank you so much for the wonderful opportunity. And I just want to add one last thing that Jesus died for us on the cross and he rose again so that we could have eternal life. So that resurrection power that lives inside of us, it's continue to have If you you know, can tell anyone to, that the surrender um, needs to be in your heart. And if you give it all to Jesus, you won't be disappointed. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Michelle Weed Brown. We are so, so grateful. This has been too good for words. Take care and God bless you. God everyone, bless you guys. Thank you so much. Have, and may we all feel the love of Christ and, and spread it for his honor and his glory today and as long as we have here. So long, everyone. Bless.